in 2020, 2021, you have the emerging middle market of music. So now you're seeing the prevalence of like individuals who are making 60,000, 70, 80,000 dollars a year. Well, you know, in order to collect that 80,000, you're collecting a million little pieces. Welcome to the music platform category. I'm super excited to be talking with Roy. Roy is the CEO of Vidya. Roy, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. To give context of why we're having this interview, we looked at well over 140 startups in the music platform category. And one of the companies that really stood out to us was Vidya. The tools that they created for especially not only artists, but labels, being able to not only manage music, distribute it in a way that's impressive. They have a lot of great modules. And so uh, we invited them to talk a little bit at our conference to share and to dive into the details of some things that they've built so far. So uh, Roy, again, thanks for doing this. I really appreciate it. Before we jump into questions about video, I think we have a, a video that we can uh, share with the audience that at least gives a, a good visual baseline understanding of what is video, and then we'll jump directly into questions. Sounds good? Sounds good. Calling all makers, movers and shakers, the artists, the artisans, stylists, nihilists, pros and bro, creators of all stripes. Your content is your currency. So how about doing more with it? Make more, earn more, be more. This is Vidya. Sync all your videos to one platform. Set rules for where they appear and how they're used. Publish them across your social channels. Track their performance. And oh yeah, make some money. So be more awesome. Be more stoked. Be more funny. Be more wild. Be more in control. Be more spontaneous. Be more curious. Be more you. Log on to video.com now and get started. Awesome video. Before we even jump into the questions about the platform itself and the things that you built, I'm, I'm just curious, is there a backstory? I, I started, um, you know, I, I have a marketing company that I started in 2008 called Trend Center Marketing. What we did over there and what we still do is we provide marketing services for independent labels as well as all the majors. And as the kind of industry was changing and we were noticing that one, it was becoming a little bit more global and we were getting hired quite honestly by more independent, smaller, like, you know, management companies or smaller distributors or labels, um, kind of thinking about where the industry was going. I kind of saw initially a need set to create a, a platform that was distribution but it was, it was actually meant to be specifically for video. So it was actually meant to be like, because I saw it like within the space, there was a lot of distribution companies and they were really focusing in on audio distribution, but there was no one that was like looking at video in a similar fashion. So at the time, it was really only YouTube was a dominant player in, in the video space, but I thought that was going to expand. I, th I think those certain things I got right and certain things I got wrong about seven years ago when I first started getting into it. But I did think that video was going to become more prominent as a medium in which people consume music. And originally it was just like a, an ancillary offering as part of my marketing service that when people wanted to distribute content to like Vivo or YouTube, which is the two main players at the time. And we had deals with platforms like Daily Motion that were like smaller platforms that if they want to monetize their video content, it was like, oh, we have this extra service. And the idea was that it was going to pay the you know, maybe the light bill or the rent or whatever, and then, then it ended up spinning out into its own company. So, so within, I don't know, within nine months, we were making some, you know, pretty good traction. And, uh, and it then turned into one of those things where it, it was meant to be 5% of our revenue and end up being, you know, more than, you know, half our revenue. And then it was kind of like, all right, well, you know, there, there's something here, you know, we, we should, we should really turn it to something bigger. The name stuck, but the idea has kind of evolved over time. I wanted to actually get into the, some of the specific functionality of your platform, because I think it's really interesting. And the, for you guys, you've, you've, you've provided a lot. It's not just content distribution. It's not, it's content management, it's rights management. So you're doing revenue track, you do, you do a lot. And I think it's really just the whole back office of being a musician or an artist and, and you're probably expanding outwards from that, but it's, it's interesting. I want to focus in on the audio and content management itself. And a part of that is also with the global distribution. When an artist is using your platform and they have the ability to upload a lot of their content and the majority of their content is within their platform, are they deploying their music 
on every platform that's available possible? Or are they supposed to be focusing on only a handful that makes sense for their audience? Like, how do you help artists navigate both not only the content that they have or managing the content they have, but where it should be distributed? Yeah, so to, to kind of be clear, a, a big part of our platform is over initially when we first started the company, we were tune core for video, like a video platform. Then we were, you know, kind of evolved into like building more, almost like a tune core competitor where we were servicing the needs of the artists. Where we stand today as a company is really servicing the needs of like the business counterpart to the artists. And, and so by providing them tools to, in, in order for them to be more scalable and providing that infrastructure, they're allowed to do what they do better. And so the way I analogize it is they say, okay, you're, you're a really good baker. You should open up a bakery. You know, when you end up finding is that like, when you open up a bakery, you spend very little of your time baking and a lot of your time doing back office stuff, paying rent, paying utilities, paying vendors, just stuff that it wouldn't matter whether or not you're a baker or, or, or in any other business. And so what Vidya tries to do is take all the parts of the business that are scalable and repeatable, regardless of the, you know, of the vertical. So whether you're doing EDM, Afro pop, hip hop, rock, the back office functions of rights management, supply chain and stuff are, are essentially all the same. And it doesn't really rely on us to be experts um, in the field where I think most of the competitors in the space, they want to do deals directly with the artists, which has its own challenges. And I think that getting to your question here is when it comes to the strategy and how we do and how they do it. Now, we certainly are there to help, but for the most part, what we find is that when we alleviate a lot of those kind of those back office concerns, it allows them to spend more time kind of paying attention to the thing and the reason why they got into it to begin with. And we find that most of our partners are, are usually very well versed in and have a very specific area of expertise. And that's what we look for in partnering up with companies, that they have a strategy already, they know what's working, but they have a scalability issue. And much like a VC kind of coming in, you don't really, there's some things that you help with, but for the most part, you're, there's a flame and you're just trying to put some gas on it to really accelerate growth. And, and that's how we see ourselves as not only a tool, but really like the way I explain is that if you're a company with two to 10 people, think of our 60 some on employees and growing as like your back office employees. So you, now you have a 70 person company, you know? It definitely makes sense. And I think it, uh, especially for your platform, really giving artists the flexibility to say, you have your strategy in which you to distribute or manage your content. And here's just the tools that are digital tools to do that in a way that makes your life a lot easier. Yeah. And, and the primary value is really having a lot of these things centralized. Convenience is a big you know, determining factor when people think about using platforms. And when you're you know, doing several functions and, and you're doing it across multiple, um, you know, because like when you think about it, the, the entertainment business and the music business, it, it has a very strong path dependency and, and, and it was done a, a very specific way in a certain way from like, you know, the early 1900s and, and each kind of version has been an iteration of that. So like the music industry wasn't built for streaming, right? It was built to the print records, the record business. And you end up having different types of companies that do different functions going back like before 2010 or whatever, promotion and, and consumption. Like if you think about it, it was, you'd hear a song on the radio and then you would go out and buy it somewhere else. And so the, so you would consume it for free. And that was the advertisement on the radio, on terrestrial radio. And then you would go to a store, which was either a mom and pop store or like a Target to then purchase something um, that you've already essentially consumed in its entirety just to have it on demand. And now those things are all, you know, and now at the time, like when you listen to something on Spotify or an Apple, it, it's both of those things, both the radio station and the purchase of the CD is essentially combined. And so there's a lot of unpacking of these kind of, you know, uh, of these things that were historically done a certain way in which most of our clients have unfortunately have had to have deals with four or five providers in order to accomplish something that can now be done in, in one place. It's interesting that having that one location where you can do a combination of things, distribute content, and then content can be the music itself, could be the music video, it could actually be the upload of the artwork of the music. You also have an analytics dashboard that tracks both just the performance of how well the content is performing for the different platforms as well, which is fantastic. Uh, 
when users and a lot of these artists are entering your platform, are they already connecting a lot of the tools that they have today for or the platforms that they're already on today, whether that's Snapchat, whether that's YouTube, or are you actually setting up accounts on behalf of the artists in your platform if they didn't have an account on, say, these platforms before? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of on a case-by-case -case basis. Yesterday, we, we have a, a deal with an individual who's a manager who manages probably a a top 50 artist globally, and he's developing a new artist that the song was going viral on TikTok just, just by happenstance, which is a, a frequent occurrence nowadays. And, and she had no social media presence. She, she just wasn't really ready, honestly, uh, to do something. It was just, it just happened. It went viral and, and the song was taken off. And now they had to get their feet under them to capitalize on the virality of the song. And in those cases, we are actually setting up all those profiles and stuff like that. But, you know, by and large, most of the, of the artists that we're dealing with already have these accounts and, and, you know, and have a, you know, because of the nature of our platform where we really try not to do deals with the artist directly, but really fun, you know, functions and do deals with the business component. Typically those individuals are not kind of, they, they've got the zero to the one stuff like figured out already in terms of figuring out like in setting up the DSPs and the social media profiles. And then from there, we're connecting to those profiles and then pulling in the data and then, and then publishing the content. I'm actually curious, do, do you also help a lot of these artists through your platform manage the social conversations or user generated content you know, that could exist in different platforms or at least how the audience is reacting and allow them to content, comment or respond, or is that directly in those platforms? They so, yeah, so right now we're not doing anything in terms of like social listening or anything in terms of, there's usually like kind of two areas in terms of like where the promotion and the distribution of content exists. And that's usually your DSPs, those are your digital service providers, and then your social media networks. And so the DSPs would be considered like a, Apple or Spotify or things like that, and your social media networks, obviously, your Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram, things like that. And for the most part, those that line is getting a little blurry. So like where YouTube, where it's like there's a social media element, it's also really a DSP. And, and Facebook is and a lot of the other platforms are becoming very similar. Right now, because there's so many moving parts, we're connecting five or six, five different copyrights, 200 destinations globally setting up all the supply chain, all the data pipelines, stuff like that. It's a huge, it's a huge task. And we're launching, I think one partner a week, just because the space is growing and the territories are huge. When you talk about every social media network and every digital service provider. So, so we haven't really dove into the management of like comments and management of social media profiles yet, but that's certainly something that would, our, our goals are really be like the, the kind of like hub for everything that you, you do, whether it's merchandising, touring, social media, social listening, promotion, distribution, stuff like that. No, I think, especially long-term, I feel like you guys have an extreme amount of potential to branch off in a lot of different ways. Having the initial problem of being able to help an artist just manage their content and the rights of the content, and then also the revenue and the royalty payments and performance of that content on several different platforms is just a tremendous feat in itself. And I think that's what the fact that you built out some of the process almost seems like end to end is, is fantastic. But I wanted to focus in on the rights management tools. You help artists manage complex ownership splits for different types of assets, depending on the territories, protection policies and stuff. You know, what's weird is the music content of all the different media categories, music is the most complex when it comes to rights, when it comes to royalties, when it comes to payments, it's unreal. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is a, I just wanted to highlight this tool because I, the complexity of managing music content, I can, is so difficult. And you guys have built out a platform for that. Do you have, maybe just for the audience perspective, could you share maybe an example of how complex ownership of a particular type of music can be or a content can be? Yeah, the challenge with music, the challenge with what we do in general is that you have to take something that's enormously complex and make it very simple. And that is the challenge. But historically, a lot of these rights, artists previously, and even a lot of labels didn't really understand the kind of the rights that were involved with music. And, and a lot of it was handled by entertainment lawyers. And so now your average 
independent label owner knows a, a lot of information that they didn't previously know because at a, essentially at a necessity. You know, when you're looking at any particular song, like a music video, for instance, you have obviously the music video right, which is the right as if it was a movie. There's a visual right that's associated with it. There's a sound recording right. And then at the composition level, which is the lyrics and melody, we have performance rights, uh, the right to print the lyrics, mechanical right, a, a sync right, and the ability to sync it to the audio to video, and then a performance right. I may have said one of those twice, but what, what happens is that all these things, like some of these rights are essentially like collected and determined by you know the government. So for instance, if you're collecting on performance rights, those things will go through ASCAP or BMI or CSAC. A sync right would be collected directly through DSP. Mechanical rights is totally different. But then if you're dealing with the same DSP and you're collecting for views in, in Europe, for instance, like you, you might go through the performance right society for the sync and for the performance. So it, it's all based on rules and regulations of different territories and different deals that have been struck that are changing over time. I don't know, like, it's like, think about the tax code, right? It's like, it's enormously complex. And they expect everyone to fully understand it and abide by it. Otherwise, there's stiff penalties. And that's how music rights work at the same time. And so while it doesn't necessarily usually result in penalties getting the tax code wrong, it does result in a lot of individuals not collecting the, all the money that they possibly could off of these streaming services. And so when you have, you know, let's just say, let's make it ultra simple and say that you had a thousand streams or a million streams on like a Spotify, for instance, or a YouTube, you might have to collect that same, that, that the same dollar that's generated for all those rights. Let's just say you stream one time and you get a dollar, right? To make it ultra simplistic. And then you say, okay, you're not just getting a dollar, you're splitting up the, that over three or four different copyrights if it's a song and then they're going to different territories depending on where that music was consumed and whether it was ad generated or or part of their kind of paid service in which the royalties are then split up even differently so like even me explaining right now is is, is crazy complex and essentially the way that we break it down on the platform is what do you own and who are the other people involved and what is their contribution and then from there like we basically do everything else so all the kind of stuff that I explained to you and that just makes your head spin and say, wait, so they don't have performance rights. What are the performance rights societies? What are neighboring rights? What are mechanical rights? What are sync rights? It just, you don't need to worry about that stuff. It's just, we set out, we made all the deals globally. You put in what you own, you put in your friend's contributions, and then we set everyone up. We pay everyone. We do all the tax compliance and we pay people every month in 150 different countries, which is another paying your collaborator in Brazil is, is another set of challenges. So all that stuff is handled by the software. I, it's interesting because it's just imagine being an artist and you're focusing on creating content and then maybe promoting your content and then having to deal with participating in what used to be live events and actually yeah. that whole process by itself is already difficult. And then you jump in and throw in the complexities of rights management and music and royalty payments and payouts and it just I couldn't only imagine that the the headaches that a lot of teams have gone through both artists and the, on the business side the labels as well yeah and, and historically I mean, listen if you're the Rolling Stones you're making tens of millions of dollars maybe a hundred million dollars on an annualized basis you have a team right you have people who are doing this stuff and now in 2020 2021 you have the emerging middle market of music so now you're seeing the prevalence of like individuals who are making sixty thousand seventy eighty thousand dollars a year so that's awesome you can make you know like there's a lot of people who are really excited over the prospect of being a musician making Eighty to one hundred thousand dollars a year, not being the richest person in the world, but they don't have to work at a restaurant. They don't have to do something, anything other than play music. In order to collect that eighty thousand, you're collecting a million little pieces, and you can't afford. You know, you do hire someone at eighty grand and then be net zero. It doesn't work. So you have to really do it. And, and this is this when I did interviews ten years ago about the idea of even starting this business. I always said whoever's going to win is going to win on, on the ability to be very efficient in, in how they do it. Because like I said, when someone's making $80,000 a year and they need to collect a million little pennies, if I said that 80 grand is broken up into little chunks of 10 and 20 cent you know, increments or micro pennies in, in, in some of these streams, you need a platform that's very efficient to make sure that you're not spending more than you're make, you know, than you make. So 
So I think video is, is an important tool, especially for this evolution of music that we're seeing. And we'll get into that a little bit later. But I, before I move past the rights management portion, you have a feature that you call social sync. And I'm just curious yeah. if you could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, so like you know, that whole kind of feature set that we developed was was of the mindset that's that's pretty kind of a common thread throughout the platform, which is the fact that we really want creators to be like the driving force behind the content and really worry about creating content and not worrying about the mechanisms in which it's collected. When the previous kind of tools that were built were every single time you create a piece of video content on a social media platform, you're creating intellectual property. So if I like film some viral video that I wasn't expecting to go viral, and all of a sudden everyone starts reposting it, technically, you know, that's just as illegal as if I were to repost the, the World Series or something like that. That is the intellectual property of the person that created it. When you're making, and these individuals are making, I don't know, some of them 10, 20 pieces of intellectual property every day. So if you're making five TikToks or 10 snaps and you're going live on Instagram, every single piece of content is IP. And, and then it has all the underlying rights and all the other stuff that we spoke about. The only way to actually claim and, and protect your intellectual property rights and really prevent other people from using it without your express you know, consent is to like actually create the content use it and upload it through a third-party platform and then let that third-party platform post it to the social media network. And I always thought that kind of disrupted the creative process is because, well, one, a lot of these social media platforms that specialize in video, you know, have, have, have spent millions, you know, if not tens of millions, a hundred million dollars, really creating and honing in their user experience. So if I'm, if I'm going on Snapchat, that's a whole user experience. If I'm going on Instagram, that's a whole nother user experience and, and there's different purposes. So the idea that you would create one platform that would push out these other platforms didn't really make sense because it doesn't work really in that environment. So we thought it would be a good idea to say, okay, once you hook up your social media platforms, let's allow the individuals to actually push out the content and then our platform would listen for it, see when they post it, pull it down, and then you could set rules based on your ownership. So if I post something on Instagram, for instance, that's just like me and you know my friends doing something and I'm an artist, because when you look at the top creators on social media networks, a lot of them are, are musicians, but the content is usually not music related. If you follow Justin Bieber on Instagram, a very small portion of that has to do with music. Most of it is just seeing into the lifestyle. And you know, the idea was that you would publish something, it would then be pulled into the platform, and then your manager or your, your business counterpart could then set rules on how that content lived on the internet. And, and that could be to monetize user-generated versions of it or re-uploads, uh, or that could be to block. And maybe you did something, maybe there's impersonation accounts, maybe there's maybe you did something stupid that you just don't want getting out there, but it's still your intellectual property of every right to be able to take it down. And the current DMCA processes just didn't really make, they're not, they were built 20 years ago, that Digital Millennium Copyright Act. We just felt like we had a better mousetrap. And so, you know, we ended up developing this software and, and then applying for a patent on the process. No, it's super cool. This is an example of how you're making that process. We talked about the, being like the back office or managing all the business aspects of being an artist. So simple uh, and so easy. And I think that's what was impressive about some of the things that you're building and allowing an artist to be who they are and let them do what they want to do and also post where they want to post, but then making sure that the, the content is accounted for and, and, and they have proper control over it. I think it's a fantastic tool. I, I wanted to probe a little bit on the, the analytics side of you provide a dashboard that really can track the performance of content across the platforms that artists are in. And a lot of that data, I'm assuming that feeds that analytic dashboards is probably just the direct integrations with those platforms. I'm just curious, given the position that you're in, does content, when an artist created, uh, if it doesn't perform that well, is it primarily because it's the content itself? Is it where it's distributed? Is it just an issue with the promotion? What, what tends to be the, the problem for a lot of artists? So it, I think it's interesting when you look at the last couple of years and rise of, of TikTok 
you know, because I've been in, in the music business basically my entire adult life. I've been doing it since I've been 18. And so there was always a thought process of that songs, yeah, like the, obviously people kind of argued over this, but the timing means a lot. And people would say, okay, Nirvana is great. But if Nirvana came out 10 years earlier or 10 years later, like it probably wouldn't have been as influential as it was, all that stuff being the same. So timing is a big part of it. And like, like I was saying, we're now seeing that with TikTok, where there's these songs that like were put out 10, 20, 30 years ago that no one cared about. And all of a sudden it's like viral hit. All of a sudden it's like now it's becoming something. And, uh, and that's pretty interesting to me and kind of goes against the idea that like the content I think it's just like anything else, right? There was a lot of false starts when it came to the electric car until Tesla came around. Sometimes being too early on something, whether it's music or an idea for a startup, that, that's a thing. And so I think it's a combination of many things. I think it's, it's certainly timing and whether the people or the industry is ready for it. It's the quality of the content. I think it's less promotion than people think. And the reason why is because I honestly haven't really seen any correlation between like marketing budgets or, or anything else or any sort of strategy and the success of a song. I've seen people spend hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars to promote a song that went nowhere. And I've seen people spend $500 on a song that has blown up. And there's really no, you know, I, I think that one of the good things uh, about the industry and where we are right now is that if the timing is right, and the content is good, like it's going to work. And I think people will find it. I, I think we have so many use cases of songs. If you, even if you look at all the top songs that are blown up on, you know, TikTok and, and subsequently really risen on top of the charts on the DSPs, you'll notice that a lot of these people are just in their bedroom, no budget, nothing, just access. And these things are going crazy. So, so it's hard to convince me that, that, I think back in the day, like I was, I, like I was joking around, if, if you're in a small town and there's like most of people's decision-making is proximity, right? So if you're in a small town and you're, and there's one girl your age, like you're probably going to date her or marry her because it's like, it's just proximity. It's availability. It's, it's access. And I think that it's the same thing. That's how the music industry was primarily was that you were able to kind of, the labels controlled all the radio stations, they, they controlled all the distribution methods, they controlled all the promotional methods, and so they controlled access. And so you like the Beatles, well, everyone liked the Beatles. And if you took people from the, around the same time, you said, okay, list out your 10 or 20 favorite bands for a certain time period of people who are now 70 years old or so, you, you'd see a lot of consistency. A lot of people would say, oh, I, like the, I like the Rolling Stones, I like the Beatles. Like that. And now if you took those people, like you, you'd be hard pressed to find people that have the same like taste and even a genre of music, let alone the bands. And it's just, it's all about accessibility. It's opened up those things. And so I guess that's a long way of saying that I think promotion was, and marketing was a lot more important in breaking bands like 20 years ago, because a handful of companies controlled all the methods of promotion and consumption and, and, and all the purchasing. But I think now, you know, with the, the, obviously the rise of the internet, the floodgates have opened and, and, and people you know, are, are discovering new stuff and, and a world of possibilities. And I think even more in the last couple of years, we've seen the rise and the evolution of the music industry move from a really US centric kind of uh, industry to like a global industry. And you're seeing people in America, and if you think about it, taking a Beatles example, for instance, I don't know, a couple of days ago was the anniversary of the Beatles playing the Ed Sullivan show. And so they were in London and they blew up. They would come to America to then be essentially like a global band, a global artist. And, and by and large, everyone in America knew who Michael Jackson was and everyone everywhere knew, you know, globally knew who Michael Jackson was. So really the U.S. pushed their musical influence on everyone else. So if you were in India, for instance, or, or Africa or, or, or even Europe, you were always aware of like your local music scene. And then you were also very aware of your of the American music scene. I think at one time they said MTV was the most globally recognized brand, specifically because we were exporting our culture to all these countries, but we weren't really importing a lot of stuff. No one, if you talk to anyone from, who was really into music in the 50s, they, and you ask them to name their, their favorite Afro pop artist, they'd be like, like, I like, they just didn't know. They, they didn't have that sense of culture that I think people are starting to discover now. And for the first time really ever, I think that the average music consumer is now 
importing and that's what you're seeing the rise of Latin music and and not like Latin music of Gloria Stefan creating it in America. You're talking about someone who's in South America, who's small, who's an independent artist being discovered by people in America then, and then and then rising and then that artist rising to some sort of like at least somewhat global or higher level of recognition across across uh, countries. So I, I think that's why I, I see that every day. I see someone who is in the middle of just some random country creating music with nothing more than access to the internet, making hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, and that, that just wasn't possible three years ago. This is something, and, and we're at the beginning stages of that. It's interesting to see the, the evolution of music being so decentralized and allowing a lot of artists, like you mentioned, from around the world, or even from kids from their basement making, or anyone making songs that doesn't really require a tremendous budget, and being able to distribute it globally. And it's, I think that's what's so interesting about your platform is the fact that you help a lot of artists and enable them to do that in a big way. If you're going to distribute your content and globally and a lot of different platforms and a lot of different countries and territories and being able to manage that content in a centralized location, it's interesting to see how you're, you are, your platform is an enabler of, of this big evolution of music and the rise of a tremendous amount of new artists and this explosion of content that exists in the space. And it's fantastic. And also culture, which is very important. So in other words, if you're an artist, I think one of the things about our platform that is unique is that because we really don't focus in on the artist, there are people in certain territories that we work with that have these, that really know and understand their respective markets. And the, the kind of methodology of the modern kind of music label is to say, okay, we have this this major record label that's located in the US, let's open up an office in this territory, send people to there and then sign those artists. And that's, I don't think that's the right way of going about it. I think the way that you do it is that for the first time ever, there's artists globally that are able to make a significant amount of money due to the rise of the internet. And there's people around them, there's an infrastructure that you have an obligation to support. And, and so when you look and you say, okay, let's take Chile, for instance, and you say, okay, in, in Chile, there's a lot of artists, but there's also a lot of people who are starting businesses. There's an infrastructure, right? There's producers, there's songwriters, there's people who are booking, there's people who are, who are running management companies, and there's people who are running record labels. And like I said, that the modern method of doing it is open up an office, sign the artist directly, and then all the local businesses get hurt. It's like when a Starbucks opens or whatever, it's like it crushes the mom and pop like coffee place or whatever. So like our whole thing is saying, we come in and say, okay, there's a lot of attention put in this, this territory. There's a person that really knows and understands is respectful of the culture and the importance of it, knows all the major players. How do we give this individual or these individuals technology and infrastructure in order to scale their business and allow that business to exist within the territory and, and create a benefit for really the broader community. And, that, and that's a lot of just our overall mission as a company, besides obviously providing these tools, is to make sure that in the emerging global music market, that, you know, that, that we recognize that th this is an opportunity for these areas to develop their own kind of music business. It doesn't need to be our version of it, because quite honestly, our version of it is backwards. Because when you look at it, like I mentioned before, a strong path dependency, like we're an iterative process. It's very similar to when you look at cell phones. And like when we came out, there was phone lines and, and there was infrastructure that we had to get through. And then other countries, when they got cell service, they just went right to cell, cellular technology. And, and they didn't have to deal with this like kind of legacy infrastructure that we had to deal with. And so they have the benefit of really going from from really just going right to streaming as like their primary source. And in the US, we do things a little backwards because I, like I said, everything has been an iteration. And so when we create our platform, one of the things that we keep in mind always is saying that let's forget about how things are done. Let's pretend like the music industry didn't exist. How would something be built if we just started today? If today was day one, what would that platform look like? And that's really what we're, we're building to that future because I think everyone gets there eventually. It just operates on a different timeline. I'm curious because especially looking at your website, it seems like you cater to for directly to both the independent artists as well as the labels or music managers. And I'm mm -hmm. just curious, what is the dynamics between 
uh, those two groups, especially when using, utilizing a platform. So do you cater more to the independent artists or more to the managers? And if they work together, do they both have access? Our, our platform has like a, a, a parent-child relationship. And, and so the manager, so it, it's important that the artist is able to create content. Like I was talking about with social sync and they're able to put out content freely. And, and, and a lot of artists, like day one, every day someone wakes up and wants to write a song or create content. And the first thing that they're exposed to are these DIY platforms in which they're able to control and put out content on their own. And then usually they will, if they're good enough, they'll usually meet some people who will say, Hey, I want to invest in you, whether that's time or money that, you know, they're willing to put in money or sweat equity to make you a little bit better. And you start building a team. And now you can't just wake up one day and put out a song. Now the his, you know, historical way of doing it is that you, you put out, you create the song, you then deliver it to your label, the label then puts it out. And again, like keeping in mind of, we try and like change, like I think whenever you build a platform and you try and, and it requires a change in user behavior, like what we try and do is say, what is the most natural thing for the artist and for the manager to do? And then how do we build out a technology that kind of requires as little you know, of, of them to kind of change how they want to do things as possible. And so the way that we, we do it, which is also different than the way other people do, is that we, we allow the manager to have a, an admin access, and then we allow the artists and producers to have their own access. And, and it kind of, it's, it's, so the manager of the label has like the parent account, and then they create child accounts. So the artist is then really free to distribute content on their own, but it's bound by the rules that are set by the parent account in terms of like money, how money flows and whether or not like you want to have approval on content or whatever. So that's, so that's kind of how we do, we do things is, is really, we don't think an artist in our experience, like when they create content, most of them content right now is king. And you really want to be able to put out content as quickly as, as possible, especially in the early days. We, we, you know, we find that the people that tend to do better tend to put out more content more consistently. And so the best way to do that is to make it as, as efficient as possible. Yeah, no, it, it makes it makes it definitely makes a lot of sense. And uh, one last question for you before we close out here, but uh, we did talk a little bit about how the music industry is evolving and especially how video fits into that picture and enables a lot of artists and around the world to really manage their content in ways that they really haven't been before. I'm just curious, where do you think the future of music management is going and what do you see that other people don't? I think it's a lot, I think it's a lot of things that I outlined before. I think we're going smaller, not bigger. And what I mean by that is that I, I don't think that you look at some of the other kind of industries, you take Netflix, for instance, Netflix kind of, you know, was really first to the game and on demand the streaming services where you had this OTT, this platform, and they had this vast library stuff. And what you find now, it's now there's Netflix, there's Disney Plus, there's Peacock, there's Sling, there's you know, there's 50 different services. And each one kind of has a very, they have a lane. And so when you're subscribing to Disney Plus, it's Marvel and Disney. Netflix is, they have, they have originals, they have whatever. And so they all kind of, they don't really overlap because they know that if you're, if you have a if you were just settling in with some popcorn and want to watch Ferris Bueller's Day Off, you could, uh, or you want to watch some other movie, you know that they're not going to win if you could find that movie on 10 different platforms because everyone's going to make a very arbitrary decision and say, oh, you know, what, I want to watch it on Netflix, I want to watch it on Amazon Prime. You, you can't win like that. So you, the only way you can win is by saying, oh, I want to watch the Tiger King. That's only on Netflix. Oh, I want to watch. Wonder Woman, that's only on Disney Plus. And so the, where the industry is going, in my opinion, I think I'm right, is that it's not going to be where three companies or two or three companies control all the music on a global basis. Because I, I think that music doesn't exist at that level, but I don't think that's where it's, even right now, that's not where it, it originates from. Where what's, what I think it's going to be more like, it's going to be thousands of independent record labels that act as a distributor, as a manager, and they are more vertically integrated with their artists. And so they're, they are helping them tour, they're helping them release merch, they're helping them produce original content, or maybe make like a Netflix, any sort of like documentary or like with Justin Bieber, or, or you see some of these other artists like releasing like independent films. And they do that in conjunction with their 
business counterpart. And that, that's where I think it's going. And they're going to specialize in different areas. So if you want to, if you're a jazz artist, you're going to, it's birds of a fle- feather kind of thing. You're going to affiliate with a group of individuals that are maybe that where they really know and specialize in your area of music and, and you're part of a community rather than being, okay, I'm the two millionth artist signed to TuneCore. It's like, it, it doesn't really do much for you. No, it definitely makes sense. And I think it's going to be really interesting to see how the future of, of music and, and artists and, and the management of music will evolve over time and, uh, and get to that vertically focused method of supporting artists and artists having a lot more control. And, but Roy, this was fantastic. I, I really appreciate you taking the time, almost an hour to chat with me. Before I close out, is there any you know, announcements or ask or questions or anything that you'd like to share with the audience? Not really. I just want, you know, thanks for your time. You know, it was a great chat. No, well, Roy, this was fantastic. And again, for the audience, why we had this conversation, we were really impressed with Video's platform. It won taking over the entire back office work of an artist and making that process seamless with not only managing content, distributing content, but dealing with the complexities of rights and where music can and cannot be, and also having to deal with royalties and, and that really the supporting this new evolution of how music is going, moving away from just massive labels and really allowing uh, artists and managers that are come from all uh, corners of the earth to be able to actually set up a, a serious means of managing their content the way that they've never been able to do before. And I think it's it's really impressive what you've created as a tool and enabling that evolution of music and uh, a lot of these uh, new artists that are going to be coming for the ecosystem. So this was fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. Cool. Thank you.